Good morning and welcome to this time of worship. Good morning. You may have noticed that your bulletin is a little bit thicker than it usually is this morning. And if you look inside there, you see that there is a spiritual gift inventory. I talked about this last week in the sermon, talking about the spiritual gifts that every Christian has. And we're not always sure exactly what they are. And so I went and I looked for the best one. I tried to find the one that wasn't too short, wasn't too long. And I found this one. It took me about 15 minutes to go through. And if you go through, it's two pages front and back, and you can just answer on all these different things. If you feel like this might be your gift, maybe it's not your gift, at the end, it'll give you an idea on all the different gifts about where you're gifted. And so I'd like everybody to take this home and to go through it and to figure out what their top three gifts are. And remember that for yourself, and then next week, I'm going to have a sheet down here that everybody can write what their top three gifts are. So we as a church together can know, well, we're looking for someone with the gift of discernment. Well, we can look through and see who has that. Or we need somebody with the gift of evangelism. We can look right through. And so we're going to pair these gifts up, the different ministries in the church, so that we together as the church can go out in the community and spread the gospel. And what's one great way to go and spread the gospel in the community, you ask? Any guesses? Starts tomorrow? There you go, Vacation Bible School. We're going to have a great Vacation Bible School this year. And so if you know anyone that might be going, remind them. If you know anyone that probably won't go, still remind them. If you can do anything for anybody in the area, please remind them about Vacation Bible School. Let them know that we're going to have a great one. We're also going to be over at Rustler Ranch on Friday. And there will be horses and all different sorts of things. And we're going to have a spectacular Vacation Bible School. Is there anything that I missed about BBS? Okay. I'm getting to know. So, everybody pray for Vacation Bible School, and invite people, show up and volunteer. See you on Monday. Good morning. Good morning. Some of the other announcements for the week, uh, because of Vacation Bible School, there won't be a quilting and craft club, and also there's going to be a special elders meeting after the service today. So if there's no other announcements, we'll go to the call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, His steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, His steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, His steadfast love endures forever. Please rise for the prayer of invitation. Pray with me. Lord, we thank you that you have gathered us here into your house. We thank you that you have gathered us here to meet with you. And so we ask that you let that happen, that you come down here to meet with us. We ask that you would teach us yourself and show us the ways in which you love us and to send us out in service. We ask that you fill this place and your people. We also ask that you be with us as we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. Join me in a prayer of confession. Let me hear your joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Have a few moments of silent confession. The assurance of pardon. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All of this is from God, who is reconciled to us through Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And now that we have been forgiven, we can have peace with God and each other. 
share a sign of peace with your forgiven brothers and sisters in Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. After we share God's peace with one another, we'll join together and sing hymn number 550, I Want to Be Like Jesus.
Gracious God, we thank you for all the gifts which you give us and the opportunities that we have to serve others through these gifts. We pray that you would take them and that you would use them as you see fit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. kings from history? Do you know any king's names? What's the king's name? King David, king David, King Solomon. That's right. Those are some kings from the Bible. Now, were King David or King Solomon good kings? Were they perfect kings? And they weren't perfect kings. So they were pretty good as far as kings go, but they weren't perfect. Can you think of any perfect kings? Jesus? You got the easy one. <laughs> Cherry picked from you. It's a good setup. Jesus is the only perfect king, so he does all the things that kings are supposed to do. He protects his people, and he rules his people, and he guides his people, and everything that he does is perfect. And who are his people? What what is his kingdom made up of? His people is us. His people is everybody in the whole wide world. We know it's not even everybody in the whole wide world. It's only some people. It's only Christians. Christians make up God's people, and there are some people that don't like God's rule, and it's very sad, but not everyone follows him. But everyone who does follow him gets to be in a perfect kingdom, and when he comes back, he'll take all of the people that believe in Jesus and follow after him, and he'll bring us into the absolute perfect kingdom, where everything will be okay, because we have a perfect king. Will you please pray with me? God, we thank you that you've given us examples of good kings, but we know that that's not all we have to expect because you are the perfect king. And when you come back, you're going to take all of your people into your kingdom and you will rule us forever and we will be in a perfect place with a perfect king. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, you can be dismissed.
time where you lift our prayers up as a congregation to God. So what are the ways that you would like to see God work in this upcoming week and the ways that God has already been working in their obvious in our midst? My friend Hazel is doing a lot better than she finally came home and she finally came home. So prayer of Thanksgiving that Hazel's doing well and came home. to come home today. Uh, we also thank you that uh, Joshua and Egan were able to come home today. Thank you for all the safety uh, to and from China. We ask that you uh, be with Joshua and the rest of the family. We also thank you that Egan is home after a, a long and difficult uh, battle, that you have been there through uh, friends and family and doctors, and you've been there healing him with your own hands. So thank you for his life as well, and we thank you that he's now home. Thank you that uh, Pauline is uh, back with us and that she uh, was not more injured. We thank you uh, for that, and we ask that you would bring quick healing for her. And so thank you for the special music and the, the gift of singing that you give to us <coughs> years, when we will be there before the throne singing your praises. We also thank you for the gift of teaching that you've given Sarah, and we ask for a blessing over her classroom, as well as help for our family in a time of transition. We also pray for the peace of Israel and all of those difficult issues over there. We ask that your people would come and show the peace that comes from only you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, it's time for the congregational choice of him, so we'll our first one for today. Okay. Since 605. First and last verses of 605.
for it. Today. 
So if you have the strength, please stand for the reading of God's Word, starting in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, starting at verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. So after reading through this, you see the seriousness with which Jesus holds the law. He says that he has not come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. He says that the very least commandment we're still supposed to teach and follow, and that if anyone even relaxes them, well, then there's a curse that comes along with them. And notice it doesn't even say to throw out, it just says to relax it. So even the least of the laws, to relax a little bit is something we ought not do, and then we'll be called the least. And so you see the seriousness with which Jesus holds the law. Now, one of the hard things about the law is that when we think of the law today, we only think of one type of law. We think of civil law. And so if someone comes up to you and they say, I broke the law, you're thinking maybe they got a speeding ticket, maybe they cheated on their taxes, or maybe they beat somebody up and are being held on assault charge. You think of a civil law. What you're probably not thinking is, I bet they called someone a fool. That's what they're upset about. I bet they forgot to tie. I bet they ate shrimp. <laughs> Probably not on your mind, because we only think of the civil law. But in Israel, they had three different types of law. They had the civil law, laws pertaining to that particular state. They also had ceremonial laws, laws that had to do with the tabernacle or the temple. And they had moral laws about morality and things that have always held. And so as we go through, we'll differentiate these three different types of laws, and that will help us to discern how it is that Jesus fulfills each of these laws, and how it is that we are supposed to react as New Testament believers. And so we'll start with the ceremonial law. The ceremonial law was anything that had to do with the central place that God was to be worshipped. So either the tabernacle or the temple. And so the ceremonial law did not always exist, because there was a time before the temple existed. So when Moses was born, there was no ceremonial law. Why? Not a trick question. There was no temple. It would have been very silly to have laws about something that did not yet exist. And so he was born, there was no temple, there was no tabernacle, there were no ceremonial laws. But then God raised Moses up, and he sent him and his people out to the desert, and he sent with them the tabernacle. It was a wonderful gift that God had given his people, a central location where they could go and worship their God. And because it was so important, he set down very specific laws on how he was to be worshipped. And he was very serious about these. If anyone did these in the wrong way, they would die. We see stories about people author, you know, offering up unauthorized fire, and they just get struck down on the spot. And God is very serious about how he was to be worshipped. And there were all these ways that his people could come to him. If they became unclean, the scriptures let us know how they were unclean. It also lets us know that they were to go there and offer a sacrifice, and what kind of sacrifice they were to offer, how the priest was to assist them in this, and all different sorts of things having to do with the ceremonial law. And this applied to the tabernacle and to the temple. But there was also a time after the temple no longer existed. Just as the law didn't always hold before the temple, it doesn't hold after the temple. 
Because about 2,000 years ago, the Romans finally got sick of all the stuff going on over in Israel, and they decided they were going to clean house. And they came in, and all at once, they destroyed the temple, they destroyed the nation, and they moved on. And so the big crisis of Judaism was what to do now that the temple was gone. But they didn't have that same crisis in Christianity because Jesus had come. Because they had learned all they needed to learn from these things in the Old Testament. And they weren't just going to throw them away. They weren't just going to say, well, Jesus is here now, so we can take the whole Old Testament and put it in the shredder and move on because something better is here. They didn't just forget about it. They looked back to it to see the foreshadowing. Because all of these things about the temple foreshadowed the coming of Christ. And so they can look back to it to see that Christ has fulfilled the ceremonial law. And look at all these amazing things that people learned. They learned that they had to go to one central place to worship God. They used to be the temple. Now we go only to Jesus to worship God. They learned that they were impure and that they needed a blood sacrifice to cover over that impurity. You know, every observant Jew was there in Jerusalem at least three times a year for the pilgrimage festivals. Any time they became impure, they wanted to offer up a fellowship offering, and they would go into the temple and had a physical animal, and they would put it down on a physical altar, and they would shed its blood. And then they, they knew that only through the shedding of blood could they be made clean. And so they can look at that and say, now we have Jesus. And he doesn't offer up the blood of animals that has to be offered time and time again, but he's offered his blood once and for all that covers all of his people. And they can see that because they understood the temple. They could see that people had to go to a priest in the temple, that we on our own could not worship God, but there had to be an intermediary. And now they knew that that priest was Jesus. Only he didn't have to cover his own sins. He wasn't like the priest who had to first offer for their own sins, and then they could work. But Jesus is the perfect priest. And so they can look at all these things and see that Jesus has fulfilled the ceremonial law. Everything about the tabernacle and the temple is pointing forward to Jesus as the perfect priest. The perfect sacrifice. The one place people could go to worship God. And so we see that Jesus has fulfilled the ceremonial law by being the perfect and ultimate priest. And so anytime we look in the Bible and we see ceremonial law, we look to Jesus. Now another category here is civil law. The law is pertaining to a country. So I'm going to ask a really easy question. This is not a trick question. Who has civil authority over where we are right now? Here upon Ohio in 2014, where you're sitting, what country owns this place? There you go, the United States. Wasn't it your question? Now, let me ask another question. Same place, exact same ground. Who had civil authority over this land 2,000 years ago? I don't know either. <laughs> I suppose it was a Native American tribe. There was a civil jurisdiction here that held civil law, and you were subject to their courts if you lived here. Now, even though none of us know who those people were, let's say I went out and I dug something up and I found definitive proof about who lived here 2,000 years ago, and I had all of their laws, and I brought them to you, and I said, I found all these laws that we haven't been following. Let's start following them. And you would say, uh -huh. <laughs> well, why not? We're in that land, right? Well, the country doesn't exist anymore. And so we're no longer under those civil laws, but we're now under the civil laws of this country. And the same thing is true in the Bible. There is a specific country, the ancient country of Israel, that at one point did not exist. You know, when Moses was born, there was no Israel, there were no civil laws of Israel. And later in history, God put a civil country there full of his people, and that was the land of Israel, and their laws held. Now, we do have a modern-day Israel, but it's not the same. There are a lot of similarities. You know, they're on very much the same plot of land, give or take a little bit. Their law is largely based on the biblical picture of Israel, just like our law is largely based on the biblical picture of Israel. But it's not exactly the same. It's not exactly the same country. And so no one is held to these rules exactly as they were, because that country has long since been destroyed. So in the same way that we aren't subject to Native American laws, there's no country in the world that's exactly subject to all of the laws in here. And so you might ask, well, why is this still important? Why do we still have it in the Bible? Why do we still read it and study it? Because when we look at this, we can see a picture of a kingdom and a king. We can look at the Bible and see that God gave the king of Israel righteous laws to govern his people by. 
And these laws were more righteous than any of the laws in the surrounding nations. You know, if you ever look at the laws in the countries that were next to Israel, when these laws were given, they are horrendous. You can get into it and see it says, well, you know, if you kill a slave, you know, well, you have to pay 20 shekels of silver and then you move on. Because a slave's life just isn't worth what a freed man's life is worth. All these sorts of things where if a noble does something, we'll just kill his daughter and that'll be, you know, good enough that you punished him. All of these laws that are horrendous. And these people in the surrounding nations had these laws, and they followed them, and then they got a good look at Israel, and they had to say to themselves, wow, this is how things are really supposed to be. You know, who is their God that he comes up with such righteous laws to govern his people? And if Israel had a good king, and they had some decent kings, then they would see that when God puts someone in charge who holds his people to these laws, someone who is good and righteous and just, the land prospers, and things go well. And you can also see, with all of the bad kings that they had, they had plenty of bad kings, that when the law is not held to, things go downhill. And then you can see there were some kings in Israel that were so wicked that people were longing for the days of just the regular bad kings and saying, man, I wish I was back under that administration. Things weren't so bad back then. And things got so bad that the country was scattered. The very country of Israel was destroyed because of such poor leadership. And so when we look back on these laws, we don't look back on them to say, we need to exactly follow every single one of these laws to the T. We don't look back and say, well, we need to follow one of these old dead kings. We look back at these laws to say, we need to follow the living king. Because the living, perfect king is Jesus. He is the one that comes and rules his people perfectly <laughs> in the way that none of his ancestors ever could. He is the one that sits on the throne of his father David and rules us perfectly. We can also look back to see that they were a holy nation. You know, all of the nations past them, there's never been one specific holy nation because God has had his nation spread out over the whole earth. The Christians are God's holy nation. And earlier in the children's sermon, I asked who are God's people. And sometimes people say, well, it's the whole world. It's everybody. God loves everybody. Everybody's God's people. But we know the sad fact is that God has to adopt us in, that we have to become citizens of this nation. No one is born into his kingdom, but he picks individual citizens that are over the face of the whole earth. And so, if you share citizenship with someone in this country, you may or may not both be God's citizens. It depends if you're Christian or not. If you go over to some country, the country that we're at war with, and you find another Christian, you share a citizenship with that other person. It's a citizenship that goes out throughout the entire earth, wherever God's people are. And he uses us today the same way that he did then to be a righteous country that goes out and spreads his glory. And so whenever we look to any of the laws that pertain to the ancient country of Israel, we can look to see how Jesus is the perfect king. Just in the same way that we can look at all the ceremonial laws and see that he's the perfect priest, we can look at the civil laws and see that he's the perfect king. So we've looked at the civil and the ceremonial, and now we come to the moral law. Now, the moral law is a little different than the first two because it knows no bounds. It's not bound by any kind of geography or time or culture. It's the moral law. And what has been moral has always been and will always be. Now, you can look back to the very beginning, and at the very beginning of time, even though it's not expressly said, the only thing that was expressly said from the beginning is don't eat the fruit from that tree, we can still know that the moral law held, that murder was still bad. Because after they fall, you know, God hasn't said in stone yet, thou shalt not murder, that doesn't belong to the Ten Commandments. But Cain knew it was wrong. Now, he wasn't plotting to kill his brother, thinking, maybe this is morally acceptable. He knew. It's been written on our hearts, and he did it anyway. And that was the very first tragedy after the fall. And so murder has always been wrong. Now, you don't even necessarily have to read the Bible to get this. You, know, you can go to other cultures that Christianity has never touched before, and you can go to those cultures and ask the people, is murder a good thing or a bad thing? And in the large majority of cultures, no matter how primitive we might consider them to be, they say, well, generally you want to stay away from murder. If they didn't feel that way, the culture wouldn't still exist because they would have all killed each other off. Now this is something basic that God has put with us to know that murder is bad. It's one of the moral laws. And this is what Jesus gets into. And I only read one of them, but he gives example after example about this moral law. And he lets them know that this isn't something that we're slacking off on here. You know, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. And so Jesus talks about the law, not just in the letter, but in spirit. 
Remember when he said that you had to be more righteous than the Pharisees? Well, the Pharisees would have held to not murder. Pretty much everybody does. You know, Jesus isn't up there talking, and he says, thou shalt not murder. People going, oh, that's such a good idea. Why haven't we thought of that before? Everyone's saying, oh, okay, Jesus, you know, we, we read that one. You know, we figured that one back out when we were four, and they taught it to us you know, in Sunday school. You know. But people then hear Jesus say, you have heard it say, do not murder, but I say unto you, don't even be angry with your brother. Don't say to your brother, you fool. Don't curse against your brother. Even the slightest infraction is murder in spirit. Because we are wishing something ill, regardless of the size, towards someone made in the image of God. You know, we might not be shooting them, but we are wishing them ill in some way. And Jesus says, even that puts you in danger of hellfire. And so if you get to the part of the service where you're looking for something to confess and you look back over your week and you think, I don't know, I think I had a pretty good week. Maybe I'll have something to confess next week. Look at this. Even the slightest infraction of the law is worthy of complete separation from God. And so we look at this and we see that Christ has come to fulfill it. Not fulfilled by throwing it out, but to fulfill it by holding to it in every little thing. Jesus followed this to the letter and to the spirit. This amazingly high amount of thou shalt not murder. You're not even calling your brother you fool. Jesus helped. When he was on the cross, he could have cursed everyone in sight. He could have been upset with them. And he says, forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they are doing. He held this perfectly. And that is why we can be saved. Because Jesus fulfilled it. He held the law perfectly the way that we were supposed to. And if we ask for his death on the cross to count as our own, we don't have to be perfect because he's already been perfect for us. Now this does not mean that we just throw out the moral law. We don't just say, well, Jesus did it for us and so now we don't have to worry about it at all. He is not saying that we're throwing out the moral law. And that's where we get into trouble. Because today there's a lot of contemporary preaching that just says, oh, you know, this, this whole moral law stuff, it's just not that important. And I can understand why there's confusion. Because people look into the Old Testament and they see all these laws and they just don't make sense to people. And they look in there and they see that it says eating shrimp is an abomination. And I say, well, what is this stuff? You know, eating shrimp is an abomination? Well, how can you trust this book if it goes on and on about eating shrimp? And they look around and they say, what else says it's an abomination? It says homosexuality is an abomination. People say, well, our culture says that that's fine, and this book says that eating shrimp is an abomination, so which one am I going to trust? Everybody in culture, what they're telling me? There's some book that's against shrimp. And there's confusion there. Even people that really do want to follow the Bible just don't know what to do about it, and it's because we don't discern the difference. We don't look at these things and say, oh, this is a law that pertains to the country of Israel. This is a law that pertains to the temple. And we think that just because there's some things in there that Jesus has fulfilled and we're foreshadowing, that we can throw out all of the law. Now, we don't think this through. Imagine if what Jesus is really saying here is that he has come to abolish the law. The whole thing. That when Jesus taught on murder, if instead of him saying, I say unto you, don't even be angry, what if he said, the whole murder thing, you know, we tried for thousands of years, you guys never got it right anyway, so forget about it. If you want to murder, just go ahead and murder. That's what would happen if Jesus abolished the law. And did Jesus come and live and die on the cross so that we could kill each other? No. He came and lived and died on the cross so that we could live, not so that we could throw all of this out. Now, this is difficult work differentiating. You know, when we look to see what this law says, there's not a little marker in our Bible that's, you know, it's highlighted for green if this is the moral law or yellow if it's the ceremonial law. We have to look into it a little bit. We have to learn for ourselves and teach. Because our culture is sliding more and more, and we're throwing out more and more of the moral law, just depending on what's popular at the time. And so together, let's do the hard work of doing this differentiation together. When we look at a law, see, what is this? Does it have to do with the temple? And if it does, you know, we, we can't go to the temple. Jesus doesn't want us to go back in time to offer a lamb when the ultimate Passover lamb has been offered. So we don't go do that thing, but we do look at how great a priest Jesus is, and we thank him for that, and we go to him to worship God. So whenever you see a law that has to do the temple, thank God that Jesus is the ultimate high priest. 
whenever you see a law that specifically deals with that ancient, ancient country of Israel, not the one we have today, but the one that we see 2,000 years ago, look to see Jesus is the great king. We can't follow that because that country doesn't exist anymore, but we do follow our living king. And when we see a moral law, we don't just throw it out. We don't just say, well, it's in there with the rest of the Old Testament. It's very confusing. We see that Jesus actually holds us to a higher standard than the Pharisees. That instead of just thou shalt not murder, he also tells us, don't even hate. And as we do all of these things, we follow after Jesus. But instead of love me, obey my commandments, and this is how we show our love to him. And as we continue to follow him in this way, people will see us as a holy nation and start to wonder, who is this God that they serve? And to come after him. Please pray with me. God, we thank you for all of the laws in the Old Testament. We know that they are confusing, and so we ask that you help us to do the hard work of going into your word and to differentiate. When we see laws that have to do with your temple, we ask us that you bring our minds around to you as our great high priest. When we see laws that had to do with the ancient country of Israel to remind us that we follow you as our great king. And when we see the moral laws, not to just keep them even in the letter, but in the spirit, so that in all ways we can follow after you with our life, that we can do and teach these things and be great in your kingdom. And pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. May you please continue to worship with me by singing hymn number 562, Be Thou My Vision.